Hi, everyone. This is Richie K2KNB, and uh, I've been a licensed ham since 1958. A lot of uh, years of inactivity, family, things like that, that sometimes get in the way, and got back into radio seriously around 2003. Most recently, I've taken to loving coaxial cables and connectors, and as a former teacher, the belief that I could teach everyone everything instantaneously, and that's just not the case. In fact, this whole thing that we'll be dealing with is really an engineering science. There are RF engineers, and they're the ones that know everything that goes on. And we're just going to try to give you an overview, particularly to make sure that when you select a cable or a coaxial connector, that you've, used, you've made an intelligent choice. Now, let's just take a quick look at what we're actually going to be dealing with. In this top simulation, in a perfect world, electricity traveling at the rate of 186,000 miles per second, you throw a switch and the light's on and, you know, very convenient, works great. But it's not the world that we live in as ham radio operators. And the world that we live in as ham radio operators, as soon as I shut this off, is this world. And in this world, suddenly, it's not a perfect world. The light is not as bright. The voltage, look at the difference in the voltage as we go along because this particular section represents every single section, multiple section of a coaxial cable in which we're affected by capacitance in this area, inductance in this area, and resistance, which is really in the form of the wire itself. And just as a quick overview, for example, if we change something like the inductance, the light begins to go a little bit better. I can change the voltage. The light begins to go brighter. If I change the resistance, we can see that, whoops, we can see that the light will actually dim. So these are things that we understand, but these are things that actually occur in our coaxial cable, in our connectors. And the question is, can we do anything about it to help give us the, the best use of our equipment. Now, let me just get out of this presentation and go into my actual PowerPoint. And we'll enlarge in this. Okay, so, started in the wrong place, sorry about that. Okay, so it's everything you ever wanted to know, but you know, that's not really the case. This is, this is an engineering skill and is so much to learn. But basically, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with something called RF, which is good from three, uh, you know, I'm blocking my own screen here, but from uh, 300 cycles to 300 billion cycles. Here's your numbers over here. Richie, you can okay. increase your larger, if you want to make your screen larger, Richie, you can with the F5. Oh, you know what? Whole... I'm sorry. No problem. Give me a second here, folks. Let me go oh, back. That's again. fantastic. Sorry, that's that's great. That. Okay. So here we are. And um, this actually, in trying to edit this, we did make a mistake. This should be in Hertz. Anyway, here's your numbers. And how do we carry signals like this? Well, we carry it in coaxial cables. And here's an example of converting. RF in wavelength to get some idea of what we're talking about in the lengths of waves. In particular, at our lower frequency, we're dealing with a wave that's about 60 miles. That's about 60 miles, well, I'll get used to that, 60 miles between these two peaks of the wave. Obviously not something that we're using, but down here, as you get to this 300 billion cycles per second, the actual wave length of a wave is three one thousandths of an inch. It's not something that we use, but it's something that I want you to be aware of as we move through this presentation. Okay, a transmitter is producing the power. An antenna is usually taking that power and at least sending out a similar amount of power or actually increasing the power. But a connector, the coaxial cable 
everything that goes through that cable is going to take away from our power. And that is called attenuation. And attenuation, as we'll see, is measured in dB losses. To be clear, when we put a plug, a coaxial connector into the line, the loss is very minimal. The loss could be as little as 0.02 per connector. And we'll see something about that in a minute, but let's go into dB loss and gain. If you have a 3 dB gain, you're going to double your power. A 3 dB loss will be half your power. And you can see how this goes down the line. Six is a quarter or four times. So just to begin with, if you see something that gives you a 3 dB loss, that means that whatever power you're putting out, let's say 100 watts, by the time it gets to where it's going, you're down to 50 watts. Can you afford to lose that much? Do you want to lose that much? How do you prevent it? What can you do? Okay. We deal with something called the characteristic impedance of the coaxial cable. And we'll see how that, uh, that characteristic impedance is determined. There are three basic factors, which are going to include the length of the line, and we're going to be looking at capacitance. The most common characteristic impedance cables that we use are 50 ohm, 75 ohm, and 93 ohm is very rare, but 75 ohm is basically for video, and 50 ohm is basically going to be for data and for power. How is that determined? Why is it 50 ohms? Well, our two most popular antennas are the ground plane, and the characteristic impedance of a ground plane is 36 ohms, and a dipole antenna where the characteristic impedance is 72 ohms. To try to be somewhere in the middle, 50 ohms fits the needs of both of these. Now, the maximum power transmitted will reach an antenna if all of the characteristic impedances are the same. And we deal basically in 50 ohms. We want our transmitter putting out 50 ohms. We want our cable carrying 50 ohms. We want our coaxial connectors carrying 50 ohms. And we want our antenna to match up as closely as possible to 50 ohms. And here is how characteristic impedance is determined. It's a relationship between the outer conductor of the center, the outer side, the outer diameter of the center conductor, and the inner side of the outer conductor. This is the shield. We'll come to that in a few minutes. And this is how much charge can be stored in this area. But this relationship is the capacitors that you were looking at in the beginning uh, presentation, because by definition, two wires here and here, separated by a material that can hold charge, is called a capacitor, and capacitors store charge. So this is the whole characteristic impedance. If I were to make a larger center conductor, and if you can just you know kind of follow, that would actually give me a characteristic of impedance of perhaps 30 ohms, which would allow me to conduct a lot of power through it because of the size of the cable, but that distance over here would decrease. And you could have shortage, you could have shortened, shortage, shorting, of the cable because of the closeness of of the um, the two plates of what is now we know to be a capacitor. Okay, <clears throat> here's an example of 50 ohm cables. They're all 50 ohms. It doesn't matter what their size is because the only thing that's determining them is the relationship. Look down here at the bottom one because we're going to mention this one later on. It's the relationship between the center conductor, the outer part of the center conductor, and the inner part of the outer conductor. So as you go through here, doesn't matter, they're all 50 ohms, and the beauty of it is that every one of these can be connected to every other one based upon the proper connection. And look at the sizes going from one and a quarter 
to an eighth of an inch, but all 50 ohms characteristic impedance, all of them usable by us. Here's an example of a huge cable. Probably this is an inch and a quarter cable right here being reduced down to a cable that we use, the size that we use, an end connector. Yes, there'll be some loss here, but minimal. So every cable, 50 ohms, can be connected to every other cable, 50 ohms. You just need the right connection and understanding what you're doing. Now, in common connectors, most connectors are made of copper or brass, and then they're plated. And they're plated because you don't want copper exposed to the elements. Copper will oxidize in air. And so to protect that, you might put on something that protects it, and it could be gold, silver, aluminum, nickel. And as we're going to learn about something called the skin effect, it's the electrons actually flowing through this protective covering that allows the connector to work well. Okay. One of the reasons why I got involved in this was called the BNC connector, because I said, you know what, what does it stand for? I didn't even know after all these years. I, I, I would have thought offhand that NC was nickel, chrome, something like that, but no. This is a bayonet Neil Councilman connector, and we'll see a little bit more about that. And this is a threaded Neil Councilman connector. If you look at it, or, or just take a quick look at this, you can see that this is rated up to about four gigahertz of frequency. And this one, the threaded, is rated up to about eight gigahertz of frequency, frequencies that we generally don't use, but, but to at least be aware of. Now, here's an example of an end connector. An end connector was, was developed by Paul Neal, an engineer, for the purpose of making a waterproof connection and capable of going up into some of these higher frequencies, in this particular case, up to 11 gigahertz. But Paul Neal, was the developer of this connector. The C connector was named after Carl Councilman. And he developed the connector, and you can see the points here. This is a bayonet connector. And again, this went up to uh, also 11 gigahertz, but again, in a bayonet form, and, and slightly larger in terms, of, uh, in terms of the size of the cable that it can handle. But these two things together, the, the C connector with its bayonet and the N connector with its waterproof become part of what is the BNC connector. And you can see the similarities here between the, the C connector and this uh, BNC connector. So the next question that came up to me, and I never thought about it, I wonder if you thought about it, is PL259, what did that stand for? Or SO239, what did that stand for? And the answer is, it's in the Army Corps, Army Signal Corps, listing of plugs. This is the 259th plug. This is the 239th socket. And that's one of those dumb moments, you know. And to be more specific, the Navy using the same plugs will have its own listings. And I believe they use a five digit number to, uh, to describe it, but it's all the same. I want to point out that this little bump here, going back to how do you determine characteristic impedance, this is actually changing the distance. And so while we call this 50 ohms, the reality is that this SO239 actually has a characteristic impedance of between 30 and 40 ohms because we've changed the distance. Does it affect anything? Not really, because this is the only distance that it's going through. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, a new plug in our arsenal is called the SMA, the Subminiature Assembly. And this is something that we find on a lot of our HTs, quick connect, but notice that it goes up to 18 gigahertz. And we'll talk about that also as we go through this. Now, this is an example of some of the plugs close up. You can see some of the differences in the fittings. This is an example. There are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of connectors because every single possible combination and mounting that you can deal with is available. And this is just to give you a broad view of, of a variety of connectors and what they might look like. Now, this is a true story, although this is a simulation of what I had to do. I always keep a connector 
handy to go from my HT to my outside antenna. Why? Because in, in a storm, if we've lost power, my HT operating at one watt or very even less power going into my outside antenna connects me to any of the repeaters that I need to connect to. I could not find the cable during Hurricane Irene. And I just started grabbing things. And I ended up now, again, this is a simulation. I, I didn't end up with a SO239 on the end here. But we're going from an SMA. I had to just put things together to go into a, even another cable to get me over to this point and, and get me to where I could connect to my outside cable. It's a scary thought. Boy, all those connectors, what are they doing? Oh, these two were just extraneous to get the barrel connectors. But, you know, is it affecting anything? Well, the answer is at 0.02 insertion loss for every one of these cables, I would have to put 50 of them there to really make any difference. So don't be concerned about putting connectors into your cable to make sense, to make it easier, to avoid a bend. But this was a true story. That's what I actually had to do during Hurricane, Hurricane Irene. Now, here's a quick summary of, of the basic connectors that we use with an idea of the frequency that they can handle and, and the amount of power. Now, the amount of power in this case is related to the higher end of the frequency. The lower the frequency, the more power it can handle. Our very common PL259 really gets a bad name. It's, it's rated to zero to 300, but it's not gonna handle 1500 watts at 300 megahertz. More likely at 100 megahertz, it'll handle the 1500 watts. And again, as we go through it, we'll get a better handle on that. But you can see that a BNC connector, you know, it's not capable of handling a lot of power, even, even at the four gigahertz. And as you go down here, each of these is actually capable of handling less watts. So 18 gigahertz, handles a very high frequency, but can only handle a certain amount of wattage. And again, we'll be understanding these points as we go along. RF does not want to make a sharp right angle because RF needs to be traveling in a path that's totally uninterrupted. So I just wanted to point out that in a right angle connector, although it's called a right angle connector, actually within the cable is a very thin cable making a very gentle bend through here. And again, does it affect, whoops, does it offend, affect everything? Yeah, for this minor distance, yeah, but it's not a problem. And of course, the cable that's in here would have to be sufficient for the power that you're running, but basically a gentle sweep, no 90 degree angles in RF. Okay, so if you're choosing a connector, these are the things that you should take into consideration. Frequency, because yes, that is going to affect characteristic impedance, almost everything that, that we uh, use will be 50 ohms. The insertion loss we've spoken about, it's minor, but at least you need to know. How much power can it handle? Is it a male or a female plug that you need? Now in this next one, the form, is it a right angle or, or what else? But also crimp versus solder. Crimps are newer, they work well, you crimp the wire on there, no soldering necessary. It is a good mechanical connection, but not necessarily a great electrical connection. There's arguments about it one way or the other, but a lot of people like to solder at least the center conductor to make sure that you have a good electrical connection there. Durability, uh, by let's say military specifications, you should be able to take a PL259 and screw it and unscrew it a certain number of times before it loses its tolerances. So are you taking something on, putting it off a lot? You know, what are you actually doing with it? Environmental considerations, where is it going to be? Is it going to be in zero degree temperature, minus 40 degree temperature, 120 degree temperature? You know, where are you actually using the plug? What kind of coupling style do you want, screw, uh, screw threads or um, a bayonet type and, and the cost? Now, I, I, one of the things I meant to point out too, Ham radio operators can be a strange bunch, as you well know. We'll spend $1,000 for a transceiver, a couple hundred dollars on an, on an antenna, and then go to a flea market looking for a good deal on coaxial cable, even used cable sometimes. Now, a summary of, of a coaxial cable is very quick. Here's your signal, here's your insulation to the other wire, and here's a protective covering. 
but it's so much more involved with involved with that. And and the particular cable that I'm going to focus on in this discussion is RG213. Here's part of the specs of RG213. It's a 13 gauge wire. Well, you may be familiar with 12 gauge. That's your household wire. We usually think of 12 gauge as uh, no. Let me go to 14 gauge. Well, either one, but 14 gauge. We think of it as being capable of 120 volts at 15 amps, therefore capable of carrying 1,800 watts. And so this cable, in theory, is capable of carrying approximately 1,800 watts. You can see some of the other specs. You can see, for example, that that braid, which is protecting it, is covering it by 96%. 96%, and we'll talk about that too. But here are some of the characteristics that make it much more, it's stranded wire, by the way, make it much more than just that quick description of wire. And by the way, here's more about it. Well, we know it's a 50 ohm characteristic impedance. By the way, look at the weight here, 21 pounds per 100 feet. You know, if, if you're doing a field day, as my club does, uh, and we lay out about 1,000 feet of cable, you know, that's 200 pounds that, that has to be carried around. And we did make a change. We went to a lighter cable, which works okay, but doesn't work okay. The covering on this, polyvinyl chloride, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So, so what's going on in that cable, the construction of the cable itself, is it's just much more than carrying the signal and, uh, and being protected. All right, so the center conductor could be silver, could be gold, unusual, but copper, best conductor, copper, which is over steel, and copper, which is over aluminum. Steel adds strength. If you're stretching it over a distance, aluminum makes it lighter weight. Here's an example of a stranded and a solid wire. Stranded wire is much more flexible. Solid wire, again, you don't want to be moving it a lot. You don't want to be putting um, flexibility into it. But I wanted to point this out, that sometimes having stranded wire is an advantage if you're screwing this down. The reason being, and you know, many antennas, the connection to the antenna itself is made with screw terminals. The reason being is that you're covering this whole surface area. In a solid wire, you're a tangent basically to this wire. So you have two tangents covering a small part of the wire. But once you have this stranded wire, look at all that surface area that you're covering, and that's on both sides. So very often a stranded wire will lead to a better connection than would be a solid wire. Okay, take a look at this. Why are we even involved with this? Well, here's some basic cables that we use. And look what happens as you go from a common 30 megahertz, which is an RHF range, as you go up into our two meter ranges, our 440 ranges and beyond. Look at how the amount of power drops off. And so if you look at that 213 down over here, I don't know why they didn't have that in there, but you can see approximately 1800 watts capable in, in our 30 megahertz range. But as we drop off here into the 440 range, we're down to 500 watts. We want to understand why that's happening. Here's a little more information measured in dB losses. When you look at the, uh, the 213, which I have to find myself here, 213 over here, this is dB losses per 100 feet. So as you get into, uh, I want to get to the 400 megahertz. So as you get into this 400 megahertz range, which we had as a comparison before, look at the losses that you have here. 4 dB, you're losing more than half of your power as you get down into that range. Can you afford to use it, do you, to lose it? Do you want to lose it? Is there anything that you can do to avoid that kind of loss? If you were to buy, for example, RG8X, which is what my club did, you know, in the 30 megahertz range, well, you know, it's so bad, but look what happens if we were using that into um, a 400 megahertz range. 6 dB, that is one quarter of my power. If I'm putting out 100 watts, I'm down to one quarter, 25 watts. Do I want to be there? And the answer is basically no. 
Okay. So in the case of the 213, we looked at the, the capability of a, of a uh, 13 gauge wire, approximately something like this, really about 2100 watts, but there's always a safety margin. What is that carrying in volts, 220 volts at four amperes? Well, that certainly sounds like, like a, uh, a reasonable amount to be carried in that wire. So why are we losing so much as we increase our power? Well, it's something called the skin effect. In the skin effect, because of the interaction between electrons and a magnetic field, as you increase the frequency, these electrons begin to flow towards the skin of the connector. And this applies to both the center conductor and to the outside shield. Now, this skin effect is not very deep, but this is where the electrons are going. So what's the first thing that becomes obvious? If we look at the whole resistance of this connector, and by the way, in an RG213, the, the resistance per thousand feet is two ohms per thousand feet. It's nothing. But what's happening here, we're not using this area. We're forcing all of our electrons into a smaller area. A smaller area is the same as having a thinner wire, and the thinner wire is giving us greater resistance. Greater resistance gives off greater heat, and suddenly you're beginning to affect the outside shield. We'll see that in another, uh, not shield, but the outside um, insulator. But this is the skin effect. And here's a better illustration of it. The electrons are all flowing to the skin, and that applies again to the outside. And basically that's it, you know? But but again, um, as more and more electrons flow to this part, the, outs the outside, the outer diameter of the, uh, inner, of the inner conductor, it begins to develop a, mount, a tremendous amount of heat. And that is what will melt this insulating material, allowing perhaps some kind of contact between the inner and the outer and causing a short. Going back for a moment to that SMA connector, which was capable of 1800 gigahertz, it's really important that at that high frequency that this insulation be of a certain nature, which we'll see again in a few moments. Because there is no current, no electrons flowing in the center of the conductor, you can actually eliminate the center. And that's what happens in these cables. Heliax cable, you can see this, this um, heliax going down through the whole cable. And over here in a hard line, there's no need for it. So why put it in there? And obviously, it will keep the cost of the material down. Could you imagine that this whole thing had to be copper, the expense that it would be and the weight that it would be? So bear that in mind. Because of the skin effect, in the RF range, it's not exactly the same when you're dealing with 60 cycles in the house. But in the RF range, that center conductor is not necessary. Now, in a DC circuit, we're dealing basically with resistance in the wire. But when we get into an AC circuit, we're now going to be dealing with, as I showed you in that early um, simulation, we're dealing with resistance, we're dealing with capacitance, and we're dealing with inductance. And these things will all affect what's going on in the wire. As we move on to the insulator that is around the wire, air is an insulator. Polyethylene is an insulator. Foam polyethylene is an insulator, but in that foam, you're injecting more air into it, which changes the way it's going to act as an insulator. And my favorite is Teflon. Now, Teflon is what's used in that SMA because it's capable of really handling high heat. But this is a name that somehow or another I've developed an affinity to, polytetrafluoroethylene. So when you're sitting around and there's nothing else to say, just throw that word out there, polytetrafluoroethylene, which is just the way of saying Teflon. But it's a great word, easy to remember. And, um, you know, when things get bad, polytetrafluoroethylene. Finally, 
Now, finally, but it's now covered by a braid. And the braid, the purpose of this braid, which is metal, is to produce a Faraday shield around this cable. Faraday shield will prevent RF from getting in. It will prevent RF from getting out. The braids are normally made of copper. It could be copper clad aluminum. It could be aluminum foil, which I didn't mention in there. Again, the purpose is to prevent RF from getting in, to get prevent RF from getting out. <coughs> Remember I mentioned that 300 billion cycles per second and the fact that the wavelength was three thousandths of an inch? Well, this is a poor braid. And it's poor because you can see the insulation in between the braid. Well, for many of us, that's not going to make a big difference. But as you get into those higher frequencies with the shorter wavelengths, yes, some of it could actually escape. And in this case, I guarantee you, if this cable were being used at that 300 billion cycles per second, I guarantee you that RF would actually be escaping from it. So the, the shield is extremely important, but also bear in mind, if you put too much shielding on a wire, you are going to make that wire stiffer and less capable of being bent easily where you have to make turns. Remember going back to the 213, the braid coverage on that one was about 96%. The jacket, Generally, polyvinyl chloride is the most common. And to be honest with you, when I looked up jackets, these are some of the materials. I have no idea what these are. But I'm going to assume that some of them will be adding waterproofing, some of them adding UV protection. I did have a length of my own cable outside, which was absolutely destroyed by the UV. It dried it up, it uh, cracked it, and my, co and my uh, braid was actually exposed. So. The coating is important. Be aware of whether you're going to bury your cable. It's got to be uh, resilient to water. Um, and again, if it's exposed to the sun, it's got to be resilient to UV lighting. Electricity is fast, but it's not instant. So when you have anything that says instant on, it cannot be. And the reason it cannot be is that electricity has to travel some distance. It may not be measurable to you, because the distance in your house from a light switch to uh, to the uh, light bulb, uh, you're not really going to be able to measure it, but it does have to cover a distance. And if it didn't, it would defy Einstein's law of relativity, which is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So just bear that in mind. Nothing is instant. Now, what's happening inside the coaxial cable? We have resistance, we spoke about that, that's the wire. Now we have what's called reactance. Reactance is what happens to an inductor in an AC circuit. It's fighting the flow of electricity. Capacitive reactance is what's happening to a capacitor inside an AC circuit. It's fighting against the flow of the current. And finally, how fast is that wave traveling down the cable? And, and that's going to be the velocity down that cable as opposed to the velocity of the speed of light. I know I got a little confusing there now. This is actually a schematic of what a cable would look like. Bear in mind that one of these would be the outside shield. So it would really be going completely around this inner one. This is every single part of a cable. There's an inductor. You have the resistance of the wire. There's a capacitor. I was gonna make a quick analogy to thinking about this as a subway. If nothing were here, the subway would go from here to there in a given amount of time, 10 minutes for argument's sake. But now it's got to make a stop all along the way. And each of those stops slows it down. And here, let's consider this people rushing from one train to another. If there's a lot of people, it slows down the transfer from the one train to the other. I know it's a crazy example, but what happens is the 
wave is going to move down here one section by one section by one section by one section. Again, traveling at close to the speed of light, but this is called the propagation of the wave as it goes down the cable. This is a graphic or a common picture of it that I'm sure you've all seen. And, and what it's trying to do here is to relate a magnetic field and a current field, which you can see, they're trying to show you here that it's at a right angle and it's at a right angle to the direction of the current and that actually they're at right angles to each other, which is perhaps a little more this, well, actually I have another slide. This is another graphic view of what's going on in there from the top, different motions, the electric field, the electron field, the magnetic field, the flow of the uh, the wave in a direction. But this is called the left-hand rule. And if you do this, if you put your hand in this direction, you get a sense of the flow of the current in one direction with the two fields, the magnetic field and the current field at right angles to each other, right? You can see that they're right angle to right angle and both of them are at right angles to the uh, flow of the wave going down the cable. Which also means that some of the action that's going on in the cable, going back to this slide for a minute, some of the action that's going on there is circular. Okay, it's not all flowing down the cable, it's, it's, it's different forces working against each other. Okay, now what is capacitive reactance? Again, it is, as the capacitor is charging and discharging, it's fighting the changes. It doesn't want to change. It wants to be in a static mode. What I wanted to point out here, again, and, and I'm not a great one for formulas. If I was um, great for formulas, I'd be an electrical engineer instead of a philosophy major. But I want you to look at the frequency. It's a fraction. We're multiplying by the frequency. As the frequency gets larger, the capacitance gets smaller and smaller and smaller. In an inductor, as we increase the inductance, we're multiplying by the frequency. So the inductance will get larger and larger and larger. But if the inductance is multiplied by the same thing as the frequency, then what happens? They're both canceling each other out. And those are the factors that are going to go into determining that 50 ohm characteristic impedance. Now, the actual characteristic impedance, which is called Z0, is actually the square root of the inductance over the capacitance. Again, we're not concerned with the formula. That's what I'm hoping you'll go in and learn more about on your own but at least to understand that it's computed. And that's why as we deal with the 50 ohm capacitance, it's actually measurable, it can actually be made. Now don't forget there's other cables, but not coaxial. Bear in mind, they still by definition are capacitors, two wires separated by a material that can store charge. A 300 ohm traditional cable and forms of lateral line. Again, air is the dielectric material, or in this case, the PVC. But in any event, carrying cable, but what's the difference between this and the coaxial cable? These are very susceptible to RF getting out and RF getting in. If you take any of these cables and lay it over a piece of metal as you're running it into your house, you're going to affect the quality of the signal coming in. Okay, when you're choosing a cable, what do you want to choose? Or what do you want to look for? You want to look for the frequency of operation. As we showed, if you know that you're going to be on two meters at 144 megahertz and you're going to do a big number out there at 500 watts, you're not going to use RG8X. You're not going to get any signal getting out there. 
So as you choose the cable, what frequency you want to operate at. Characteristic impedance, well, again, we stick to 50 ohm characteristic impedance. How much power? Well, at one point I was operating 600 watts out of the shack. You know, I, I needed a certain cable. Now I'm basically operating barefoot 100 watts and my cable needs are different. <clears throat> How much distance am I covering? Because don't forget the loss is measured per 100 feet. So if I'm losing 3 dB in 100 feet, if I go to 200 feet, that's 6 dB. Again, one quarter of my power. Flexibility. Where am I running the cable? Am I running um, through a house? Am I going through walls? Do I have to flex it? All of these are the considerations in choosing the cable. Now, if you remember back to the LMR cables, I'm check my phone. back to the LMR cables, I pointed to this LMR 1700. Take a look at the specs on this. Look at how much you are losing. First of all, look how much power you can put out there. Four kilowatts of power. Look how much you're losing next to nothing. Next to nothing. This is one and a quarter inch cable. How much is it? On average, $17 a foot. Why would anybody run it? Well, commercial installations, you're running up a building, 300, 400, 500 feet, you can't afford the loss. And so you will pay that amount of money. I'm running towards my time. Here's some summaries, 100 watts at a 3 dB loss is 50 watts, 100 watts at a 6 dB is 25, 100 watts at a 10 dB loss is 10 watts. Can you afford to lose that? Can you compute this manually? Can you get some rough idea of, of um, how much you're losing, you know, so that somebody said to you, that's a 7 dB loss. Yeah. Can you do that quickly? To make it quick, yes. Work with the numbers you know, 3 dB, 6 dB, 10 dB, and find the number that matches what you're looking for. A 12 dB gain is what I'm looking for here. 12 dB, um, 12 dB has gotten By 12 minus, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I went too fast here. Well, we want to see what a 2 dB gain is. A 12 dB gain minus 10 is 2, B, 2, B, uh, 2 dBs. That's how we're going to get to it. 12 dBs, 100 watts times 2, double, times 2 times 2 times 2. I'm rushing through this because I know I'm going to limit time. It's going to come up to 1,600 watts minus 10 dB means 160 watts. I've done it manually in my head. It's just to give you an idea of working with these numbers, find the number that gets you to what you're looking for. In this case, how do I get to 2? 12 minus 2, 12 is 4 times 3, or 2 times 6 minus 10. I know that's a little complicated, but that's a way of computing it manually. The other thing that I wanted to point out was how to quickly figure You know, if somebody said to me, you're putting 100 watts out, I said, well, that sounds like a lot of power. What does that actually equate to in terms of how many volts and how many amps am I putting out? And I was thinking to myself, well, that's got to be a big number. And then I actually did the math. Well, in this case, I used 75 watts as an example. Remember that power is equal to current times amperage. So therefore, we, we follow this out and we solve for one of these. So we're solving in this case to get a value for I, for the current. We go into Ohm's law, current uh, voltage is equal to current times resistance. We plug in our numbers, okay? And we come up, and it, this is why characteristic impedance is important, because we can now figure out what is that, that's my 45 minute warning. So now we are now in, in the, um, let me shut that off, so now, because we know that it's 50 ohms, I'm able to plug in the resistance into the Ohm's law formula. And I come up with the fact that at 75 watts, we're coming up to 61.2 volts at 1.2 amps. Again, to give you an idea of what cable will be suitable for what you're doing. A very thin cable, very thick cable, totally dependent upon what you're doing. And finally, the end, my right end is connected.
Neil, any questions? Okay, we have um, a couple of questions. One was, uh, is there a particular cable type? Well, let's let's back up one. The first question was, uh, where can I get a copy of that circuit simulation program? So there's some people that that like that. Is that a free program, or is that something you can you can download yes. off the internet? Yes. If you look at uh, P H E T simulations, P H E T Henry Edward Thomas P H E T simulations. It's a product of the University of Colorado. It's free, of course. They'd like donations. They are tremendous for not only physical uh, uh, simulations in physics, but chemistry, mathematics. There's some great programs on there for kids, um, games, tremendous simulations. P H E T simulations. Okay, and let's see. We have a little bit of time. You showed a picture of a variety of cables that vary greatly in diameter, but we're all 50 ohm cables. Why would somebody select a larger diameter over a smaller or vice versa? Which I think you covered, but if you have any further comments on that. Well, again, the larger the diameter, the more the capability to handle the higher power and that higher frequency as you're increasing your frequency and you're moving towards the skin effect, you're actually reducing the amount of surface available for the flow and therefore creating more heat. That's why that last cable that I showed you was an inch and a quarter capable of carrying um, 400 um, uh, kilovolts and being able to have almost no loss at, at, you know, at tremendous distances. Okay, and finally, is there a particular cable type that survives well in sub-freezing and particularly sub-zero uh, conditions for parks on the air or winter field day? Most of your cables will have a rating that is sufficient at 32 degrees or um, you know, even down to zero. Most of them get into the negative range, but you know, that's talking about the environmental considerations, which was one of the late thoughts that came to my mind, because let's say you have coaxial cable in an airplane landing in Las Vegas in the middle of the summer. Well, that airplane at altitude is at probably minus 40 degrees. And as it lands, it's 120 degrees um, Fahrenheit. It needs to be able to sustain that. Most cables will do that. So if you're outside in parks on the air, from the point of view of lightness, I would certainly recommend RG8X. But if you're going to be travel, uh, using a lot of footage of that, then just be aware. Now, I, I wanna point out, I mentioned to you that my club runs about a thousand feet or 1200 feet of cabling on field day. We were using RG213, we were using RG8, heavyweight cables. So we switched to RG8X. For most cases, at 100 feet, the loss is so minimal, it, it doesn't mean a lot. But then, because of the need to spread out our antennas, some of our antennas are 200 feet from our stations. We've now doubled that loss. If you're putting that into a Yagi antenna, which, as you probably know, will give you gain, that's one thing, but we weren't. We were putting it into antennas that almost have no gain. So we're losing by the length of our cable and we're not gaining at the antenna. So I don't think we did ourselves any good. And because of that, we'll probably go back at least on those long runs to a better cable. Bear in mind, again, you can connect any cable to any cable as long as it's 50 ohms. And again, the, the, the losses will be measured by the length of the cable um, or in dB per 100 feet. So also bear in mind that if you're only running one foot of, of, a, DB, uh, of a cable that has a, let's say a three dB loss at 100 feet, at one foot, you're only gonna lose one one hundredth of that. And that came home to roost with me because I run 9913 into the house. And boy, from that connection, I was trying to run 9913 to my, to my amplifier and to my transceiver. And someone said, no, no, run something thinner like RG8 or, or, or um, 
RG58. And I, and I was saying, well, I'm going to lose something. Well, whatever you're losing, you're only losing in six inches or a foot or a foot and a half. It's meaningless. It's meaningless in the scheme of things. So don't be afraid yeah. to do what works best for you in terms of the cables. Okay, we're going to have to uh, wrap this up. And uh, thank you for doing the presentation. And I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it. The slide deck will be available on the Ham Radio University website. Uh, we got to uh, end the webinar and uh, get ready to queue up the next the next uh, presentation, which will be uh, Parks on the Air. Thanks, Richie. Great job. Really good job. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Appreciate it.